Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and this here is Yoda. This is the recent addition to my family. You may have read one of my previous messages from a couple of months ago when I was actually trying to find a way to raise money for a dog charity where I actually adopted this little guy. But the thing is due to the coronavirus unfortunately some of the plans had to be postponed, well technically indefinitely. I don't really know when I'm going to do the fundraiser yet and what exactly I'm going to do, but it's probably going to be something a little bit different from what I originally planned, which was essentially a big stream of various shelters here in Seoul and an attempt to raise some money for them. Okay, I think this is a little bit more comfortable for him. So anyway, what is this video about? Well, I still wanted to talk about dogs, and mostly because there are certain things that I've learned in the past few months from reading quite a lot of various papers from the dog experts learning about, well, essentially dog behavior. Okay, change of positions. He's getting a little bit heavy. And in a nutshell, as the title of this video says, we're going to be talking about love. So let's talk a little bit more about this, and welcome to What The Math. So we're talking about the idea of love and more specifically the love of dog toward their owner. And this is something that I guess most of us kind of heard of but never really considered scientifically. Now obviously various pet owners will claim that their dogs or their cats love them, there's a lot of proof that they have, usually it's something to do with the behavior that they show, but scientifically speaking we could definitely explain it all away with just animal behavior. For example, a dog will obviously be attached to you because it knows that you feed it and it, you provide shelter. At the same time, we don't really even have a very good definition of what love is, but in the last few decades or so, a lot of scientific uh, studies have actually established at least one major component to how we can technically describe love scientifically, which thus allows us to establish whether dogs and other animals can actually love us or not. In other words, we can try to find a way to explain the question of can a dog love you? And at least one researcher from US has been doing quite a lot of different studies on uh, dog behavior and has recently even published a few books related to what he believes dog really feel. Clive Wine from Arizona State University is one of these experts that essentially published quite a lot of papers in the last few decades. And he does make quite a strong point in regards to dog love. So let's talk a little bit more about this. First of all, how do we even describe this so-called love? Well, modern science usually refers to love as hormonal response. And specifically here we're talking about one hormone, the one you see on the screen, this is known as oxytocin. Oxytocin is a hormone that plays a lot of different roles in our social lives. For example, social bonding, childbirth, actual romantic dating, and it even helps mother produce milk in order to uh, then bond even more with their baby. It also actually has an effect on our behavior and does seem to produce more pro-social behavior, such as for example helping others, different types of romantic attachment, uh, different types of generosity, feeling trust towards someone, and of course other pro-social behavior. So in a sense this is the hormone that you can kind of use to describe extreme friendship, uh, friendliness, and of course loving behavior. Some of the best studies actually come from uh, studying the reaction mothers have to their newborn children, and a lot of loving motherly behavior is always associated with much higher levels of oxytocin, whereas withdrawal, motherly withdrawal and depression is associated with much lower levels of oxytocin. So measuring this hormone can definitely allow us to quantify the so-called love. Well, it just so happens that some of the modern studies also discovered that our little furry friends, our canine friends, have a very similar oxytocin response when they see someone that they really love. And specifically here we're talking about what you would call their owner, their human. They do seem to love their human and show this love hormonally. And this has also been tested quite thoroughly. For example, one of the experiments placed a dog um, in an environment where there was a bowl of food and their so-called owner or their human in the same room, at a relatively similar distance to each other. When the door was open and the dog was presented with a choice, without any exceptions every single dog went for their human first and only after this proceeded to eat the food. In other words, dogs did show preference for seeing their human first before eating. In another study from 2003, scientists have actually learned that when you pet your dog or when people pet their dogs, the levels of oxytocin went up after about 20 minutes in both the dog and the owner. And the owner could obviously explain this by saying, yeah, I love my dog, but technically since the dogs can't speak, we can only use the hormone to try to explain what the dogs felt. 
probably also the same feeling as their human. And when those studies were replicated in other conditions, every single time dogs seem to actually exhibit this oxytocin response to the, well, source of their affection. And technically doesn't have to be a human either. Because in the last few years we found at least one known case, and this was actually published here on BBC News as well, where the target of dogs oxytocin was not a human but a penguin, and specifically the penguin colony that the dog was protecting from all of the foxes that were trying to kill them. And even though it's pretty common for people to attribute this love or other emotions that are only technically human to animals, it seems that love does seem to apply to dogs, at least from the perspective of hormones. And the thing is here, we're not really talking about intelligence at all, we're not really talking about dogs being smarter than other animals, because, for example, dolphins, they do possess a lot more intelligence, they're able to communicate using very complex grammar, they also are able to actually distinguish themselves in the mirror, which most dogs cannot really do. But we don't really know if dolphins can exhibit love. We do know that dogs can. But now the question becomes, how is that even possible? How can dogs, and not for example wolves, which don't seem to exhibit the same effects, have this? And some of the recent studies were finally able to answer this. And to try to answer the question of how this is possible, we have to talk a little bit more about genetics, and specifically a relatively uh, unknown disorder known as Williams Syndrome. Williams Syndrome is essentially a genetic disorder characterized by certain changes in appearance, while at the same time, unfortunately, also causing certain uh, intellectual disabilities. Sometimes they're more severe than others, but in most cases, what makes Williams syndrome unique is how it affects the social behavior of people with this genetic disorder. Without exception, they all become extremely social, extremely friendly, and basically only wanting to be loved and to provide love to others. It's literally what you would call and I know this is going to sound cheesy, but being a wonderful person. So in other words, it's one of the more unique and more unusual genetic disorders, with some of the people becoming relatively famous as well because of their friendliness. And the fun fact here is that the so-called legend of elves, or these friendly creatures that used to exist in the Victorian era, may actually have come from people suffering from this disorder back in the 1700s, 1600s which is very likely where all of the elven mythology began from. So next time you hear about elves in any kind of fantasy books or movies, think of where it all started. But what do elves and people with Williams Syndrome have to do with what we're talking about? Dog love. Well, turns out that everything. It turns out that the same genes that affect people with Williams Syndrome seem to affect dogs. Or in other words, dogs seem to be, well, wolves with Williams Syndrome or at least a kind of a variant of that syndrome. And it seems to affect them in a somewhat similar way to the way it affects humans. They want to have a lot of love, they want to express love, and they want to be really friendly toward the whatever is their source of and target of affection. And all of these previous studies from the last few years seem to show that really all that dogs want from us is to be with us and to be in our company. They don't really care about food as much as they care about us, Neither do they care about so-called pack leader, as many training uh, books teach us. They just want to have this feeling of oxytocin in their brain. They literally just want to have their social needs met and to show love and to be loved as well. And because this genetic component has been identified and actually tested and retested several times, it does seem to provide an idea that, well, all of this is genetic and hormonal. It's not just something that we attribute to dogs just because the way that we usually think about other animals. In other words, it seems that dogs evolved to be this way. In the last 8 to 10,000 years, their genes changed to have them have this unusual behavior that seems to be not really present in any other animal except for human beings so far. Or at least nothing concrete we've been able to identify in, for example, cats, dolphins, or so on. And because we believe that the purpose of oxytocin is to strengthen the social connections, we now definitely believe that it was actually this genetic component, this genetic disorder, that allowed dogs to express these feelings that they previously did not have. And interestingly, just like people with Williams Syndrome, dogs are also extremely social, they want to interact with pretty much everyone, and they constantly appear overly happy. Something that their ancestors wolves do not necessarily share at all. And what's more, a lot of these recent studies have also established that dogs seem to react much better to just being praised than to be fed. In other words, they don't really care about food just as much as we think they do. Instead, they want to be talked to, they want to be held, they want to be played with, and 
pet it all the time. And this is something that was established using various MRI studies when the dogs were put in certain conditions and their brains were scanned to see if they responded in a certain way. So in other words, all of this is pure science. But we are still not entirely sure when all of this happened. We believe that it probably occurred about 8 to 10,000 years ago, but we don't know what caused all of these genetic disorders to suddenly appear. But there is a really important takeaway here, and that's in regards to how we train our dogs. All of these books that focus on us becoming the so-called pack leader or training dogs by being really strict with them are technically completely wrong. We should be doing the opposite. These funny bundles of joy only want to feel love and they don't want to be isolated. They want to be with you. And all your dog really wants is to make you happy as well. And this is something that we definitely need to remember next time we try to punish our dog for, for example, pooping on the floor or chewing our favorite shoes or stealing a cable and then destroying it. All of which just happened to me yesterday. But you know, those are all choices I made when I adopted this dog. So this is something I'm going to have to deal with for a while. Anyway, so hopefully now you know a little bit more about dogs and how they truly do love you, scientifically speaking. And if you're not a dog person and more of a cat person, well, I'll try to find something about cats, but so far it seems that they are kind of the opposite. Exhibiting more of an evil not-love hormone, which I'm gonna have to do some research on. Anyway, on that note, thank you so much for watching, hopefully you enjoyed this video, and hopefully in the next few weeks I'll finally be able to organize some kind of a fundraiser, but if not, I'll make sure to do this sometime in the summer when the whole virus thing goes away. And whether you have a dog or not, I thought that this is something important. I thought that this is something that most of us really need to be aware of, considering that dogs are technically the second most common pet after cats. But anyway, once we learn more about dogs or cats or other animals, or once I discover another really interesting study, I'll make sure to follow this up in one of the future videos. Until then, thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences and these things, dogs and other animals, and oh my god, his breath really smells, I need to brush his teeth. Anyway, I'll see you guys later, Yoda, say goodbye, space out, and as always, bye bye. You need to smile, can you smile? You can't smile, look at that face, it doesn't smile. It's always sad. And welcome to What the Math. Okay, he's about to lick me and his breath really smells bad. Uh, I think he's actually enjoying this. Huh, maybe I should bring him more often.